SEO, Google, it's only one of thousands, hundreds yeah. of thousands of uses yeah. of AI and not necessarily the most interesting. Yeah, I mean, ML is, is, is not, uh, you know, ML in search is a use case that I think we all should be somewhat grateful for. I think Google just as a utility in the world, I'm, I'm not necessarily calling them benevolent per se, mm. nor, I'm not disparaging them, I'm not making them a saint. I'm just saying it's awful nice that we can ask any question that we want. So you're, you're right, it's, it's, it's one of countless uh, millions of potential ways that ML can be used in business processes or uh, results we could glean with the tech. Um, right, but you said ML uh, for Google, but then you said you're working on AI. Oh, What's yeah, the yeah. distinction so, there for you? Sure, sure. So um, artificial intelligence is a broader umbrella than ML. So ML is normally seen as a subset of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is anytime we can get a computer to do something otherwise we would have needed a human to use. Very right. ephemeral, very tough to pin down because as soon as we understand it, we won't call it AI anymore. But um, many of the academics and we've, we have uh, articles on, if you Google, what is artificial intelligence emerge, that's E-M-E-R-J, or what is machine learning emerge, you'll see the definitions that we've come up with, which are drawn from some of the top researchers in this field. And there's a little bit of debate here, but broadly speaking, AI refers to anything that a machine is doing that otherwise would have required a human. Let's say 80% of that these days is going to be machine learning, because that's really where the cutting edge is. That's where a lot of the startup ecosystem exists. But often, these tools are using some old natural language processing approach or some old uh, sort of AI approach that maybe we couldn't technically call ML. So in a business context, often AI can be useful as a, a business term to sort of encapsulate um, any, uh, let's say, consortium of technologies that in any way involve machine learning. Maybe not every element of it is. Uh, that that delivers a result we couldn't have had otherwise. So um, yeah, work, okay. works as an umbrella term, functional. Brilliant, wonderful. So uh, Google's using an awful lot of uh, machine learning. And uh, you were saying earlier on, actually, understanding machine learning isn't a useful pastime for an SEO. Um, it isn't going to help us understand the algorithm. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Now, this isn't to say that SEOs couldn't potentially benefit from a conceptual understanding of where AI is used in search. And I'm, I'm happy to lay out some of that conceptual understanding for you today. Um, but, but it is to say that the nuances of how it's used um, and in what way and what factors are weighed more than others, we still don't really know all that much about, of course, you know, uh, you know, SEOs don't don't know this stuff either. So um, it might be handy to get a sense of how the tech works, you know, a little bit of a better understanding of how things are ranked or, um, you know, how Google is, is getting a sense of, uh, you know, what kind of content should should rank above other bits of content. Um, and, and that may help to, uh, let's say, congeal a clustered idea about an SEO strategy like, well, I do think this will work in the future because, you know, it seems to check out with conceptually how I understand ML. But the fact of the matter is, I don't think it's any kind of silver bullet in terms of understanding. Right. Um, I mean, you Frederick, it, but not automatically, you know, beneficial. Yeah. I mean, Frederick Dubu from Bing was saying that, I mean, basically, they set the rules for the machine. They give it the data. They label the data very carefully. They push it into the machine. Then they say to the machine, now go out and figure this out and, and, and give us the best results you can. And then they measure it the results that come out the other side. And it's that measurement that's the important part, not so much the factors they put in, because the factors they put in, the machine can find other factors they hadn't thought about. What is important is what are the parameters of measurement of success and failure that they're applying to the machine once yeah. it's completed the task. So it's more important to understand what are those, what are those measurements? Uh, what are they, how are they judging the machine? Yeah, and I can I can even talk a little bit about what that looks like if you'd like. Oh, brilliant. Great. So um, we work with uh, at Emerge. We we work with essentially all of the largest data labeling companies in the world. So the companies that take, uh, let's just say, you know, I'm Coca Cola, and I want to know what everybody in the world is saying about Coca Cola on social media or on web forums or whatever. Um, you know, we may need human beings to translate a lot of that stuff and to, you know, put that somewhere, what have you. And a, a lot of those companies that have uh, crowdsourced workers are now being used for data, data labeling related tasks. So let me give you an example. Let's say we have a search engine like a Bing that's going to roll out in Malaysia. Now, there's only yeah. so much Malaysian Internet um, that, that's actually searchable, and they probably don't have a massive corpus of how people have responded to different kinds of search results in that particular language. 
So what, what often needs to happen is that we need to get uh, a, a rather large swath of folks who are native in that language um, to uh, potentially give us some feedback on the search results for different kinds of terms. So we might say, hey, you know, we might have a hundred things or a thousand things we want them to search for, and we might have them score by different criteria how mm -hmm. well the top three results do on those factors. Um, so, you know, is this relevant in terms of the actual content you want it? Does this seem like a reputable uh, website or authority? Yeah. Does this, you know, whatever the case may be. Now, we don't know exactly what all of those things are, but what we do know is that the Microsofts and the Googles of the world pay these uh, data labeling companies like, like Appin or uh, Gango or uh, uh, Figure 8 or any of the big players in that space. Um, lots and lots and lots of money. They're definitely the whales. They're, they're one of one of the major category of whales in, in that world. So by doing that, um, human beings can do a little bit of the initial feeding of what's re what's relevant, what's reputable. Now in English, that's un unlikely to be done. That, that might be being done in some very long tail, interesting areas, just to kind of fact check the machine, make, make a quick double check as to are we really steering wrong here? Um, you know, so, some level of that, human oversight on some kind of searches may be happening in the background in English, but it's nowhere near what we'd need to bootstrap a search engine in Malaysian or bootstrap a search engine in some obscure Southeast Asian language that neither you nor I have ever heard of. Um, so, so that, that effort is sort of getting the, uh, getting the machine started. Now, what happens- Right, okay, time, sorry, that's just for getting it started. This isn't, this isn't the measurement over time because once you've got it started, then yeah. you start measuring the results that it's actually producing over time. For sure, time. so both, both actually. So, there's, um, so we'll talk about the feedback from users and then we'll also talk about the long tail requirement of manually grooming data. So we'll talk right, about- Right, yeah. Sorry, but I mean, uh, Frederick Debu was saying, A, there's feedback from users, B, they've got their quality raters who actually rate the, the, the quality of the results. Um, yes. According to a set of guidelines that we actually yeah. know, we've seen them from Google, yep. at least uh, for the, for yep. the, for the uh, blue links. But, and so what, they're now, what, what he was saying is what's important is what's in there, what we're aiming to do, because even if the machine can't do it today, it's definitely where the machine's going. And you were talking earlier on about the future, and you're saying, well, I need to do this because I know that's what they're trying to do, and they will end up doing it. When you said they'll end up doing it, what do you mean? <laughs> Thank you very much for bringing me back on that one. We're, we're, a great example is EAT, uh, Expertise, Authority, and Trust. Google says, is this site authoritative? Is the yes, person yes, yes, or company yep. expert, and can we trust them? And that's a big part of the user quality, gu the rate, quality rate of guidelines, excuse me. Um, so there's no real way for us to say what are the factors that go into it, but what we can say is the algorithm is being trained to respect yes. the feedback yes. both from users and from the quality raters, that what they perceive to be EAT. Yeah. So we don't know what the factors are, but we can say this is what people perceive to be EAT, and that's where we should be aiming, because that's where the machine will get to. Fair? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. So so you talked about the raters and then you talked about the users. And it's important that we talk about both. So I can give right. you a quick backdrop as to how both of them are part of the living breathing system. Of, oh, okay. Of oh, I like living breathing. That's a brilliant word because right. it make it, so, it, it gives it yeah, life, doesn't it? It's it's undeniably living and breathing. Every more or less every ML system is, and especially in search, this is the case. Because the world changes. You know, if if I search mm. for red rain boots on Amazon, you know, if it's the springtime, I'm probably going to get a different series of results than if it's the winter, you know, two years from now, I'll get a different results than from today, based on what people are buying that's similar to red rain boots, based on what red rain boots are selling best. Same thing with Google, um, you know, uh, every, you know, day of the week versus weekend, whatever the relevance is always shifting and breathing and altering and new kinds of news events and things are coming about. So these systems need to be living. So let's talk about okay, just a really quick question before we go on. Yeah, I would have thought that Google would be better at dealing with days of the week than it would be with seasons because it's had more days of the week to train on than it has seasons. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, pr I presume so. So there might be okay. certain things that are searched more on Monday. So if, if you search for how do I X? Now, by the way, I don't have a great example for you, but like, let's say you're searching for something related to chest pain. You know, Monday apparently is when people die of heart attacks. I don't know this for sure. This is random <laughs> anecdote, okay? But yeah. let's just say- Today's I, Wednesday, so we're safe. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We made it. You and I, we, we made it this week. <laughs> Until next Monday, we're yeah. clear for another four days. Um, but, uh, 
But yeah, let's just say hypothetically, there's massive spikes in, in searches around chest pain on Mondays and Tuesdays or something. Google may be more likely to take things tertiarily related to that and show things about heart attack risk on those days. By the way, that's speculation and it's random, but it's, it's also certainly the case in um, countless areas. So weekends, for example, you know, certain kinds of searches might be more correlated to, um, you know, uh, d doing an activity on a weekend than otherwise it'd be more information gathering on a weekday or something like that. Yeah. There's likely to be all kinds of variants of that kind, but, um, uh, same thing with seasons, same thing with, I mean, you name it. I mean, uh, proximity to certain holidays and then certain holidays. Well, geez, what geo are we talking about? Are we talking about India? Are we talking about Boston? I mean, we've got different holidays here. Ooh, so, and the weather, uh, and if the weather's depressing or if it's sunny, then we're happy. That, that we're may, yeah, that, that may play into the mix as well, to be frank. I mean, in fact, it, it almost certainly does to some degree. I, I know not exactly how, and I know not exactly mm. where, but but almost certainly it does. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, inquiry that has to do with rain, if we know for a fact that it's torrential where you are, may pull up practical stuff like uh, basement pumps or umbrellas. While, you know, if we know for a fact that it damn well ain't raining, um, it may be taken as more of an information request about something else. So we may show slightly different results, but regardless, so living, living, breathing, right? Yeah. yeah. And also, also sorry. And, and you're talking about kind of all right. these different parameters. I mean, we could go on all day about the different day. things that might affect slightly. And the thing about machine learning is it's taking something we can speculate about like this, and it takes it to such an extent that we just can't fathom it. We can't begin to understand yeah. quite how many uh, factors the machine is taking into account every time it produces a result. Yeah. And, and the fact of the matter is the weights of those factors are always tilting and shifting based on what Google wants to do for better relevance, what Google wants to do for less ability to gamify the system, right? They, they might want to change their rules just to make sure you don't know what they are. They also may want to change your rules just <laughs> to improve relevance. Now, if they can do both at the same time and it's a straight line, that's what they're going to do. But it's almost certain that they're, they're making adjustments for both those purposes, for yeah. preventing it to be gamed and also for improving relevance. They'd love to do both all the time. And I, I, I also once heard that with machine learning, every time the program runs, it runs slightly differently. So you're actually never going to catch up with it because every time it runs, it's learned from the last run. Therefore, yeah. the next one is going to be very slightly different and so on and so forth. So it's, not, it's never going to be a standing target. There's nothing we can actually shoot at with any reliability. Yeah, that, that, that makes it challenging. I mean, there are humans running the show here. So many factors, humans are not, they're not defining the, the end state. So a human might not, in Google, some guy named Steven doesn't necessarily have a lever that puts how much weight is there on the word rain and weather for these kind of Boston search results. There's no guy named Steven doing that. However, there was somebody at some point who decided that weather data should play as part of the mix and who decided certain categories of search that maybe that hypothesis would be tested on, and then who got user feedback to see if those results seemed more relevant based on mm. their click-through data, and then who said, okay, we can roll this out to other inquiries. So there's people building out new features that they want to test, new elements, right? Google is not, it's not a general intelligence that sits in the middle like a glowing blue orb and then shoots off into this data category and shoots off to that data category and sucks it all in and says, I'll factor all these factors. That's not how it works. So it's not, it's not a, it's not, it's not God. So it, Google, it's, it's simply human beings saying, well, this corpus of data we think could be used to inform this category of searches in this geo region and in this language, let's go ahead and permit that. And then let's garner some feedback from it and think, see if we can expand that use of weather data to other categories of searches. And then let's scratch right. our chin again and let's look at user behavior. So, so, so yeah. it's, it's a cycle. And, and then you were just talking, that's in fact where we started off is saying that, that user data that says, yes, this is good. No, this isn't good. That trains the machine that says to the machine, yes, uh, this is affirmation that you are going the right way, or this is uh, a critical critical analysis of why where you're getting it wrong, so that the machine can then adjust. Uh, and that yeah. user feedback we were saying one is from user feedback directly to Google, and the other is by their quality raters. And you're going to explain a little bit about that. Yeah. So really, we could think about three factors here: quality raters, the pure user feedback, and then the people named Steve with levers at Google. And again, the people named Steve aren't touching on the granular, like, oh, right. Jason Barnard is about to Google 
where to find local pubs. And I don't know what you people in the UK do, but I presume it has something to do with pubs. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I love, I love ragging my friends in the UK, but, uh, but yeah, you're searching for pubs and, uh, you know, it's, nobody's controlling that, but, but people are thinking through different features. So let's talk about all three of those categories. First user feedback. So user feedback, especially in, um, you know, again, we're not talking about the Malaysian bootstrap example. We're talking about just English. You know, you're, you're sitting wherever you are in the UK and you're, you're searching for things. Um, in this case, w Google is looking at uh, and what factors we don't know exactly, but they're looking at potentially how quickly do people click on the search result? Um, right. How long do they spend on the page before they click something? How many pages do they go through? Page one, page two, page three, before they find, uh, you know, the thing that they want to click on. Um, when they click on something, how long does it take for them to, you know, pogo stick SEO term out of that search result and into some other search result? And then is there one of those search results that they stick with? And we, we might pr propose that the one that they stick with was the one that satisfied them because they didn't right. pogo stick back out. Um, yeah. So they're taking these proxy metrics for what they believe is indicative of satisfying the user's intent. So okay. what, what got the job done for the user? And they're proxying behavior that satisfies intent. Now, the fact of the matter is I might, you know, jump into a search result and get so frustrated, I just like call my friend Bill. And so I didn't actually get the answer on that page. Um, so, so that's just a proxy. They don't know if my, if my intent was satisfied. Um, however, but, they but on the sheer, huh? sorry. On the sheer scale of the number of people doing this, stuff. that's it. That's it. That's it. Excuse no, me. So, yep. Yeah, so it's it, it, it's it's very unlikely that you know it's it's extremely likely. Let's put it this way: that if forty percent of the people that click this result, you know, end up sticking, and we have thousands yeah. and thousands of people every month searching the exact set of keywords within a certain geo region, then and and everything else has you know is getting pogo sticked. You know, like yep. they're only sticking eight percent of the time, maximum for any of the other results. We may presume, okay, this one's doing a better job. So again, higher volume, we're going to have higher uh, likelihood of of sort of solid results there. Um, yep. But uh, but and then yeah, Nathan Chalmers from Bing, who's the whole page algorithm guy. I mean, he talks about this a lot, and I think that's kind of fundamentally important. It's that that user satisfaction measured at the whole page level, um, and. He also mentioned that what they can then do is extrapolate from that onto the long tail queries where they don't have much data and actually get it pretty right, get the answers pretty correct, excuse me, get the machines to produce those results, as you said earlier on, by taking it further than we could as human beings. They can extrapolate from this mass of data and get it right even for the very long tail queries. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole aim. So being able yeah. to sort of take um, you know, what satisfies search for a restaurant, what satisfies search for a product, what satisfies search for a historical fact. We might have really popular historical facts and really unpopular historical facts, but be able to extrapolate those things uh, backwards and, and, and be able to figure out what would work for similar kinds of searches. Now, that takes us to, well, I'd like to get into our second category of people, which is manual human label folks. Yep. And then I'd like to talk about the guy his name Steve with letters. <laughs> Um, You're so, very good at this interview thing, aren't you? You prepare all the questions. I, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I just I, I know what we wanted to tackle here today. I want to make sure I can touch on. Yeah, it. So, great. Okay, so, uh, so quality writers. Yeah, quality raters. So, so um, you know, we talked about the bootstrapping level quality rating that might happen in Malaysia, and those folks might not even be on for the long term. So, some quality raters are going to be on, you know, full time folks for a really, really long time. Some of those Malaysian efforts will involve a huge ballooned force of people right. and then a much more limited force of people in the long tail. Um, with, with English, you know, we're, we're kind of in the long tail all the time because we have so much data already pumping through the system, we can presume, about most, about most factors anyway. So with that being said, um, with raters, we would want to do a couple things. So number one, for all searches, don't care what category, could be the most boring thing, how to lose you know, fat on my stomach, you know, the things that get searched a bajillion times, you know, Chinese food near me, you know, the, the most banal, uh, repetitive, obnoxiously boring searches in the world, we still would want some light comb of human rating across the entirety of that gradient, more or less, not, not every search, right, but, but all the major categories that we think are important, just to see, are there any things that are weird? You know, are, are there, you know, does anybody notice, hey, by golly, you know, I sure do like these top two results, but it really feels, so the top two are like always really crushing it for me. But, you know, when I'm looking at the others, I remembered a whole page where I felt like I could click on any of them and get the job done. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just not feeling the same way. You know, there may be some 
oddities that are spinning up from how the algorithm is being tilted and shifted that we may want to be mindful of. Or there may be certain categories of answers that humans consistently score slightly worse than they did six months ago. That may be because the humans are more uh, uh, using a tighter set of, of scrutiny criteria, and maybe that's just a little right. side effect. It may also be because you know we're not really improving there as we are in, in other areas of, of the of the algorithm writ large. So, so they're going to have a, a teams that do the sanity check across the board constantly to check yeah. that nothing goes horribly wrong. And then they say, okay, today we're going to focus on this, and we're going to have a big bunch of these people checking this particular idea, which is the idea that our friend Stephen has, has introduced, and we want to check that Stephen hasn't yeah, got it wrong. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so this this loops us into Stephen. So, uh, and again, the guy's name probably isn't Steve. I'm sure there's plenty of gals in there as well. But we're using Stephen as our representative guy. Uh, if, if we said Stevie, it could be either. Yeah, Stevie. Okay, Stevie's good. That's a nice gender neutral uh, name there. So, so Stevie's got levers, and S Stevie, um, to some degree, is informing our quality assurance folks um, as to to what to look at. So, we probably have some general pace and cadence of what is checked and how that Stevie doesn't have to bark out in the morning. Oh, it's eight o'clock. Hey, let's go check this today, guys. <laughs> that, that, there's a schedule for this stuff. And yeah. people have have things to do and stuff to look at, et cetera. However, um, folks in search, you know, higher up folks are likely informing what that calendar of checking looks like and what maybe we want to show our assurance folks more of or less of based on what we want to investigate what we suspect might be right or wrong. Right. Similarly, um, we, you know, the, the, the Stevies of the world, will have to come up with theories around how our data is coming back. So we may find less pogo sticking on this particular issue, more search volume on this particular issue, um, a really big geography shift between um, the number of people who seem satisfied by answers about this, you know, in this state versus this state or something like that. And these may all spin up theories about what we could do to improve. And so with those theories, we might adjust the algorithm by, let's say, weighing certain elements of authority less heavily for certain kinds of legal questions that, that maybe don't require it. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, by the way, I'm making random hypotheses with you. And so sure. um, these Stevies will then you know, go ahead and tilt and alter things and then maybe send our assurance folks to, to groom over that and then look at our user feedback from that and then use what we get from that feedback to hypothesize what else we might want to change. So all of this has to get filtered through human intelligence. It's not like the machine just automatically gets this proxy data for satisfying intent. So um, how, how well do they stick? How, what things do they click on? Whatever the case may be. Uh, how many pages they have to go through to find what they want? Uh, whatever. It's not yeah. like that can just sit there and run itself. Humans have to say, oh, is that an improvement? Or does that just mean our second and third pages are maybe worse than they used to be? Right, so, um, which, which, which is 100% what Frederick was saying. It's metrics. Uh, yep. that, that Stevie person who's, what, what they're shouting out in the morning is saying, right, we're measuring this today and this is a measure of success. That's a measure of failure. What are the metrics is what we should be focusing on. And the rate, quality rate of guidelines are a very good set of metrics that we can actually use. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure, I'm sure different projects have different quality rate or guidelines, right? They, they oh, might oh. have... They might have yeah. different sub projects that require extra granularity about this kind of a product purchase or this kind of a legal question that you wouldn't have for where's Chinese food near me. Well, you absolutely nailed it there because when I was talking to the guys at Bing, I mean, I talked to the guy for the feature snippet, Ali Alvi, uh, the guy for the whole page was Nathan, and they all have different teams of, they call them human judges rather than quality writers. Amazon have got a horrible word for my camera, what it is. Um, but um, okay, Frederic told me, and it made me very upset. Uh, read the article on Search Engine Journal to know that one. Um, and they each have their own teams of quality writers or human judges. And I, now you're saying, in fact, it goes even more granular than that, is that you will have different human judges or uh, quality writers for different areas within the search stratosphere of topics and regions. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you, you might have, so two things, um, two, two things here. You might have different humans doing the job of the actual, let's call them judges or quality raters, or you might just have a different set of checklists that they're using yeah. for certain criteria. So um, in the in the data labeling world, and again, we, we've uh, done research work and to some degree even uh, marketing work with essentially all the big players in that space. Um, certain certain aspects of data labeling, if we're labeling, I mentioned medical imagery a little while ago here in, in our initial short conversation. If we're labeling uh, you know, MRIs 
Um, we're not getting people that understand English and just putting them on MRI data. I mean, we need people who are trained in that space. Same thing with, with certain kinds of legal concerns or certain kinds of translation tasks or certain kinds of you name it. We need people with certain criteria. So there's, there's some jobs of the fact checking, the quality assurance that require at bare minimum, maybe a language right. requirement or a bilingual requirement or um, maybe even some degree of a subtle skills background. There, there's potentially some of that. Uh, for, for Google, different people that are good at certain areas, um, maybe people that have been specifically trained on product, like like purchase inquiries. Maybe they didn't go to college for Google searching for products, but they've specifically been tasked with quality assurance on those kinds of tasks. Other people on maybe finding locations, other people on. So it could be skills that they actually have from their background. It could be things they've been specifically trained on within Google to be quality assurance for that kind of thing. And or it could just be language. Um, so, so that's differences in the person who is our quality assurance person. They may be allocated differently. Also, the criteria. If mm -hmm. I'm Google, if I'm Stevie, and I've got some really firm hypotheses, some nuanced, granular hypotheses around how um, uh, credibility comes through in a yep. URL and in a link for really important medical searches where people feel like they really have to be learning from the best, right. I may come up with a new checklist for how we want to search for certain kinds of um, uh, uh, symptoms or certain kinds of treatments. And, and I may want to do a comb on some of these common searches with our, our human auditors um, with a new list and get a sense of whether the hypothesized factors that maybe I'm, I'm considering are, are actually correlating well with what users seem to like. I um, mean, with, with, with what do I want to maybe score dif differently? And so, um, of course, as, as the guy named Stevie, um, we've got to really think through because there's an infinite number of things we can test. Yes. So we have to think about the biggest levers we can move that are going to be not, hopefully not disruptive to the users yeah. and hopefully going to make the biggest positive impact to the relevance of our search on the aggregate. But once we find those pockets, it may not only, it, it's, it's not just send the auditors, it's send what auditors potentially, right? Potentially it's send what auditors, certainly by language, but also by other criteria and also send them with what checklist, the general mm -hmm. checklist or the Stevie special checklist for this particular medical hypothesis of how we're measuring credibility. And then that may inform the whole way the algorithm works for that subset of medical searches moving forward if we find that it really works well. So again, it gets pretty detailed here and the feedback between humans and you know, our auditors and our people in house um, is, is really, again, it's a living, breathing system. Every corner of the system is growing and learning and shifting as user behavior and uh, internal hypotheses are being informed. And that, the whole point of all this, I mean, that's a brilliant explanation. Uh, is Danny Goodwin was talking about it yesterday. I had him on my podcast talking about the whole aim is to satisfy the user. And that's what Google's aiming to do. So ultimately, that's what we need to do. And he said, sounds trite, sounds boring. Everybody's saying it, but it's true. Yeah. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was absolutely brilliant. And uh, I loved talking to you. And I could have gone on all day. But I think this was a good chunk, and we'll maybe do another chunk another day uh, in the future if this one goes down well. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate you having me here. Have a lot of fun. Bye-bye.